Bahamas where people were devastated by Hurricane Dorian and they had nowhere to go except the U.S., which is the nearest, and the Trump administration shut them out and said, no, we're not going to allow you to come in. So environmental justice means not only investing in these frontline communities, uh, but making sure that climate refugees are taken care of and have a place to go, because it is partially our fault that they're being affected in this way. Um, number three is the protection and restoration of biodiversity. Um, that one's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> number two, we have... Um, sustainable agriculture. So we know that our agricultural sector can take in as much carbon as our entire transportation sector comes uh, puts out. So we need to look at solutions that aren't just about getting to carbon neutral, but we can also look at carbon negative solutions that can help us get there. And then finally, a Green New Deal, which is that 100% transition um, away from fossil fuels, net zero emissions by 2030. So those were our demands. And it was just incredible being there. I was there in New York City. Um, like I said, 250,000 people were all there um, uniting together uh, for these solutions. I think one thing that was really amazing about this, not only is the fact that it was solidarity between all kinds of people, um, youth, people of color, the working class. We had, I think, 2,000 people str uh, strike from Google and 2,000 people from Amazon, which is absolutely incredible. But one thing that's even more amazing was who organized these. These were young people, um, indigenous people, black and brown people, um, people like myself and like Asia, as you see here, we're literally 17 years old and we're building this global movement. Um, we shouldn't have to, but here we are and we're going to make sure that our voices are heard. Um, and so that's what September 20th was all about. Um, I think that people clearly took notice and we're just going to keep building the moment, the movement from here on out. This is just the beginning. This is just the start. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Maybe we'll um, say to folks too that the, um, that we have time at the end of this as well for questions. So um, we're also looking at the, uh, looking at the chat box on the side. So thanks for some of the comments. And um, we'll make sure that we get to some questions. There's a request um, for each of us to just reintroduce ourselves. So um, maybe uh, um, I will just reintroduce myself and then when it gets to each of you, if you wanna do your reintroduction as well. Um, but my name's Carlene Pickard and I work at Lush Cosmetics. We're based here in Vancouver, um, but we're part of the global climate strikes, specifically in the United States in the 20th. We shut down all of our retail stores and had um, about two and a half thousand staff out on the streets in their local communities. And then doing the same thing again here on the 27th in Canada, where our 50 retail stores, as well as our manufacturing staff, both in Toronto and um, Vancouver, will be out at local marches. So really pleased to be here with Asha in Vancouver. We'll start with you you also just your where are you in the planning for the 27th and what's it all going to look like all righty so first of all just to reintroduce myself my name is asha new york i am 17 years old and i am an organizer with climate strike canada which is our national movement and also locally with sustainability teams which is our organization here in vancouver british columbia so as Falcon mentioned a number of countries such as the u.s had their major strike dates on september 20th we in Canada opted to do ours on the 27th, but we actually decided to have a whole week of action to kind of respect both strike dates. So we kicked off our week of action last Friday as well with a die-in. It was a nationally coordinated die-in all at the same time at 12 p.m. Uh, yes, 12 p.m. Pacific time. So all the major cities across Canada hosted these die-ins in public places. And for anyone who doesn't know what a die-in is, Basically, it's a type of protest where people drop to the ground with some kind of symbol. So we had a whistle signaling everyone to drop to the ground. And they stay there for a long period of time to kind of signal what our fates look like because of the climate crisis, to show that our lives are really on the line and that we will be the casualties at the end of the day. So we had a massive turnout here in Vancouver, far bigger than we ever anticipated. And so we've been doing a series of activities throughout the week just to have this whole week of action. So for example, we're doing a chalk and transit action this week. So to put the advertising out all over the city so that everyone knows to gear up for our major strike on the 27th. Now, September 27th, we are expecting 30,000 people here in Vancouver. Now, considering at our last strike on May 3rd, we had 3,000, that's 10 times more. So we are very much looking forward to that. Our biggest strike to date in Canada was Montreal, March 15th, where we had about 150,000 people who came out. 
So we managed to mobilize all of the student unions at the major universities in Montreal. And that's how we got those massive numbers. And we've really just been building on what we learned about that. So we've been engaging businesses such as Lush and a number of businesses will be walking out with us because part of the messaging for this strike too is that it's not just a school strike. We are making this into a general strike for climate. It is an intergenerational effort to show that everyone is being called upon to help solve this issue of the climate crisis. That it shouldn't be just left to the students because like Felicon said, this shouldn't be our job. We're just teenagers, we should be in school, we should be hanging out with our friends, but instead we're dedicating hours and hours every day to organizing. So for March, for uh, September 27th rather, we are calling upon all generations, whether you're still in elementary school or if you're a senior and you already have grandchildren, we're asking everyone to come out and join this movement on the 27th. And we're hoping to shatter some records here in Vancouver and in Canada. Yeah. Um, great. The, um, so in, in the words or in the middle of this week of action to wanted to um, ask both Asha and Felquan, I think you've done a little bit of it, Asha, but sharing a little bit of the learnings um, and Tanu as well, I think being in the back end of, um, of the work that you all have been doing too, just, um, you know, in a way to, so in a way so that we here in Vancouver are totally, we're in Canada are totally prepared, um, but also as we look forward to continuing to build this work together, what are some of the learnings that we already know that have come out? So maybe Felicon, if I'd start with you. Yeah, so should I talk from like an organizing perspective or just at, like in general? I mean, I think there's the, certainly for, for us at Lush and the way that we've been engaging our customers in the store, both like building people, um, build, building people's knowledge to know what was going to happen either on the 20th or the 27th, but just also engaging in the conversation around the climate crisis. There is still a lot of wonder that folks have about how to get engaged. And so I think hearing from an organizer's perspective on um, what's been really successful and maybe um, some things that we'll continue to build on would be great. Yeah, okay. So I think one thing that was important that I touched a bit upon that I learned um, so much about was the importance of solidarity, how much stronger these strikes are when we work with different groups, different organizations, when we work with labor unions, um, et cetera, et cetera, to come out together. Like like Aisha just uh, mentioned, she got all the student unions to walk out and that made the strike even more powerful. We need to be doing so much more of that solidarity work, that movement building work um, side by side, because we are all in this fight together. We're not going to just be able to do that alone. It's it's impossible. You know, I always say that the fossil fuel industry, um, they're united. They're united in their money. They have the same message and they have tons of money to go ahead and spend and get out on all that types of messaging. So if these organizations and if these people powered, uh, the people powered movement is not united, we're not going to win. So the importance of solidarity is uh, the first big one. Um, secondary to that is kind of the team building aspect of that and the importance, um, this is a more personal part, but not trying to put the entire load on yourself. Um, this is stressful. I, I don't know how many times I have to say this, but we should not have to do this. We are 17 years old. I should be applying for college. I should be, I don't know, playing basketball, any of the above, whatever it may be. Um, none of the things that I should be doing right now should be trying to solve a global crisis. Um, so you need to have people who are with you, friends, maybe in the movement, not only friends, but colleagues, people who work in maybe the same realm as you, who understand what you're doing, what you're going through, to be able to give you that support, both in terms of work support, but in terms of also mental support, and in terms of having just, you know, a friend, someone who's, who you know, and you can just talk to about these types of things. So I guess those are the two biggest things that um, I can touch upon. If there's anything else that I, I think of, I'll definitely go ahead and like chime in later, but um, going to go ahead and pass the mic to y'all. Yeah, so I'd just like to, first of all, echo what Felicon was saying about engaging different community groups. So whether it be unions, businesses, that's definitely where we've seen a lot of success. So whether it be um, workers unions or student unions, getting these representatives to speak on behalf of these groups that oftentimes people do want to come out and strike with us but they feel like they can because they're afraid of missing work or missing school assignments. So part of our messaging and what we found has been really successful is kind of disrupting that business as usual mindset and saying, well, no, actually go ahead and skip that test and or strike from school, uh, strike from work that day because we can't move forward until we address this issue, which was part of the messaging that we had for our September 20th die-in. And one of the reasons why we had it all at the same time nationwide was because we wanted to really show that we can't move forward until we address this issue. So 
part of what we've been doing is working to somewhat normalize it to some extent that climate striking is what we should be doing. It's not too radical, rather it's just radical enough. That's what we need to do to get people to wake up. So when we start marketing it like that, that's when people really start coming and getting more engaged. Uh, I'd also like to echo what Felicon said about wellness because that's something we've definitely seen on our team because climate striking and organizing is very, very stressful. It is a lot of work and it really has an emotional toll. I know that's one thing we really felt in Canada when we found out that the TMX pipeline, that Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion was approved. And that was really something that we struggled with a lot as a group because it really felt like the, the, um, it really felt like it was a real blow to us that everything we'd been saying so far wasn't being listened to. So having our group, we have a wellness call every Wednesday in our organizing group just to really talk about what we're feeling and how we can move forward and grow as activists from what we're feeling. Um, those are some of the major thoughts that came to my mind, but definitely engaging student groups. Yeah, uh, we've also found that a lot of uh, local school districts have been voting to support the climate strikes, which has been really great because it means that finally, we're not having teachers who are scheduling tests on those days and therefore students aren't able to leave. But we're seeing more cooperation between teachers and students. And it again, it feels like really more of a unified movement. That's part of the reason why we had an intergenerational strike because we recognize as much as the students want action, we're not alone. And we all need to work together if we wanna see real change be achieved. Yeah, that's most of the things that come to my mind. Anu? Yeah, um, thank you. So it'd be amazing to hear <laughs> your learnings out of it. Yeah, I just really want to appreciate what um, Asha and Felicon said um, and really echoing that like this movement is really going to take all of us and all sectors um, and there is a role for all of us. Um, I'd also say a major learning for me in this experience is the power of building a multi-generational and multi-racial movement for climate justice. As an adult, ensuring that we're supporting young people, checking our egos, and recognizing that the kind of movement we want to build is one where we're learning from each other to force the hand of those in power to demand our human right to a just and equitable world. One where we can breathe clean air, drink clean water, um, and live where we want to live without fear of climate impacts. I also want to say that the reality of the climate crisis is that not everyone is impacted equally. So recognizing that those on the front lines of the crisis who are hit the hardest by stronger hurricanes, wildfires, floods, droughts are often poor working class from black, brown, indigenous and migrant communities and are from the global south. So places like the Pacific Islands, Bangladesh, Bahamas, to name a few places. And in our work, and in our work to demand climate action, we have to center those who are most impacted. I'm wondering, um, because I know, you know, you and 350 have been doing this work for so long, if there's um, just some reflections as well about, you know, what was different in this and, and what it was like being an organizer to not just sort of go through the same, do the same things. I mean, we're sort of always trying to learn, but to not do the same things. And if there were things that were fundamentally that different this time in preparing for the strikes. Tanu, if you have any thoughts on that. On what was fundamentally different this time in preparing for the strikes? Yeah, yeah, I, mean, yeah I think that this time around, you know, it, it really was a multi-generational effort where young people were leading and we were supporting and following. And I think 350.org took that really seriously to support young people. Um, and, you know, the, the demands that Felicon spoke of in the U.S., those were youth created. Um, and it's really incredible to see young people really taking, um, you know, a stand against the fossil fuel industry um, and really telling it like it is. I think that that's what's really incredible about what's been able to happen over the last um, year, but even within the last couple of months of us like collectively organizing these strikes, is that young people have shifted the zeitgeist. They have literally um, you know, changed the conversation around climate so that we're not just talking about um, you know, like weak climate action or, you know, false solutions to climate, but are really calling out um, the industries who um, have caused emissions um, and who needs to be held accountable and who needs to pay for the kinds of climate action we need. 
Yeah, Philip, I was going to um, ask you a question around those demands. I know that the um, that, that that there had been a ton of different conversations that happened over the period before the demands did come out, and just wondered if you wanted to share or if there's anything to share around there about how that process came together in the end. Yeah, so um, like she said, those demands were entirely created by youth. Um, we literally met in a camp in Boone, Iowa, of all places, and it was uh, organized from, um, from every state, I believe, and from all eight different organizations that are part of that coalition. So it was really incredible to be able to meet these people that, I mean, I'd only talk to over Slack or Zoom calls or whatever, um, or seen on social media, all in one place at once. So it was definitely an incredible and such an inspiring experience. Um, but yeah, it literally started with a five hour um, little meeting in the middle of like, um, what do you call that? Like, I guess a lawn or like a, a field, um, in the middle of the field, um, a circle of chairs and people just talked for five hours and those frontline youth and uh, from all different types of frontline communities, black, brown, indigenous, uh, people from the Caribbean like myself, people from the global south, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that we're bringing forth these demands, which is part of the reason, like the new said, that you see that these de these demands actually have depth to them. For a long time, we've been talking about these kind of uh, nibbling around the edges, I guess you could say incrementalist solutions to the climate crisis that really won't solve the crisis in the long run. And not only will they not solve the crisis, but they don't even address the inequalities that we've already created because of the fossil fuel industries um, in the long run, you know, from like I said earlier, with environmental racism, with pollution inside of communities like mine, with uh, climate refugees, the 7 million already this year, there's already 7 million climate refugees. They don't address these. So once, once you bring all these types of people together from different communities, and especially youth who are going to have to live their entire lives in this crisis, that's when you see uh, solutions to this depth. Um, so there was actually some backlash originally um, from these demands because of they, people felt they were too political. They had the name Green New Deal over it. Um, we called it the era of the Green New Deal. Um, so eventually we had to break down into smaller groups and we had the larger frontline demands that the entire coalition used, but uh, some of the organizations in the smaller group are still going with the era of the Green New Deal messaging. We do not want to be Generation Z because we don't want to be the last generation. We want to be Generation G and D, Generation Green New Deal. Um, so some of us are still using that messaging, and my group is included in that because um, well, we like it. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, that's kind of how the demands came to fruition. And I'm so incredibly proud of the work we've done uh, getting these demands and getting them out. And not only that, but you know, the subset demands as well, and the Generation Green New Deal, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez just made um, another video about Generation Green New Deal, because even people who have brought these, these conversations to the front are being inspired by the youth, so that's just incredible. And that conversation around Green New Deal is certainly something that's alive here in Canada. Um, we were going to talk a little bit in a bit about kind of what's next, but just seeing Asha kind of agreeing with a lot of the demands, wondering if there's a similar process here or how Climate Strike Canada is planning on messaging demands for the Friday. Right, yeah. So we do have a list of demands on our website. I don't know them off the top of my head, but many of them are very similar to what Felicon was talking about in the US. So a lot about protection for frontline communities, um, making sure that, that environmental rights are enshrined as a fundamental human right, because essentially we can't live our lives without a healthy environment so having that right made part of our constitution made part of our country so those are some of the things we're advocating for but very much similar we also do have a push for the green new deal in canada of uh, kind of modified but to fit canada so that's not directly a climate strike canada effort but we do have an organization called our time which has been really fantastic and they've been working to promote a green new deal in canada so we do have a push. It's very, very similar. Uh, we did. We recently reevaluated our demands, so I'm not sure how we're going to be talking about them at the strikes because they're still in the process of being fine-tuned. I mean, as Felicon was saying, it's all youth-written. In Canada, our movement is entirely youth-led. We are. We even hesitate to have adults in our Slack because we are so adamant on being youth-led. And when we create these demands, it's very much, we go word by word, making sure everything is perfect, everything is truly representative, and that climate justice is a, the foundation of everything we do. 
So you can find those. I believe the demands are live now at, at climatestrikecanada.org. So they can be found on our website. And yeah, so we're not quite sure. I don't think at this point how we're going to be pushing for those demands, but they are live online and we will be pushing for them in the lead up to the election. That's great. Right, which is, yes. which is the next thing we're going to talk about. Um, but um, so we have a federal election in Canada coming up on October 21st and just sort of thinking about that conversation, but maybe start with you folks down south first, um, just in terms of what's next now that we're in, a, in, in, in your lives, like a post-September 20th environment, sort of what, what's next and how do we keep building together for whoever wants to start first? Um, I feel like when you want to go, go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think, yeah, a lot of our work is going to be electoral, not only on, you know, the presidential scale, but making sure we have a Green New Deal candidates um, all the way up and down the ballot. The local elections matter. And of course, the House of Representatives and the Senate matter. So we're going to be doing a lot of work um, in that round, pressuring not only existing incumbents to support the Green New Deal um, through different efforts, but also, you know, pushing new candidates and primary opponents and whatnot that are going to support these um, bold transformative policies. Um, we also, also are going to be continuing with the strikes. I know that there is a strike date that's still being discussed um, internationally, but um, we're going to be continuing with the strikes and with that part of the movement. And we're also going to be doing a lot of advocacy work as well, um, get, gain, garnering public support for different policies and uh, making the case for the policies that we support. So um, that's what it looks like from our side. A lot of stuff is still in development, but I'm definitely really excited going to the election to do that work. Yeah, and just to add in the US today is actually National Voter Registration Day. And so if you do have the privilege of being a US citizen, please, and you can vote, you're a voting age, please um, register to vote. Uh, you can do so um, at a link. It's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash strike, then vote. Um, you know, and for myself, uh, as an immigrant to the US, I, I'm constantly pushing my um, US citizen friends to vote. and to vote for a candidate with the most ambitious climate action plan who is equally good on issues such as immigration and racial justice and healthcare and more because the climate justice movement is a movement of intersecting um, justices. Um, and then in terms of uh, other things that you can do, um, we have uh, 350.org has a, a next steps call, uh, a national call on October 3rd. Um, it's called We Are Unstoppable, Building a Movement to Shut Down Fossil Fuels. Uh, you can register for that at 350.org slash next steps and beyond the suite you can plug into um, on the ground fights against the fossil fuel industry by texting strike that's s-t-r-i-k-e in all caps to 83224 again 83224 and I also wanted to just shout out that um this week, there's a lot of actions happening across the U.S. Um, at the local level that's really demonstrating that, um, you know, the movement, um, you know, is beyond just one moment. It's not just September 20th, but there's a whole entire week of action. And so um, this week from places like Colorado and San Francisco and Seattle and New Hampshire and Minneapolis, there are, um, you know, uh, local actions happening um, at fossil fuel sites that you can learn about. Um, if you are in those areas, you can learn about it at 350.org slash strike USA uh, to find out more. And just to give you like a little taste of what's happening this week, uh, just yesterday, thousands of people participated in shutting down Washington, D.C. A large coalition shut down the city to stop business as usual, um, you know, to call out the workings of power and to call for an end to coal, oil and gas and the influence of the fossil fuel industry in politics. Um, and for the rest of the week, uh, there's actions like uh, protesting the Line 3 pipeline in Minnesota to calling out the Suncor oil refinery in Colorado and rallying against companies that are backing ICE, uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement, as well as investing in fossil fuels. Um, and so we really encourage people to get to know about those actions that are happening in cities like Seattle and San Francisco. There are indigenous led actions. Um, that are following the strike. So Seattle activists will be are leading a four day walk from the Tacoma LNG to the state capital in Olympia to call uh, the state to restore the Salish Sea. In San Francisco, activists are shutting down the financial district on September 25th 
that's tomorrow, and to demand financial divestment from fossil fuels uh, in an indigenous-led action um, led by Idle No More. And then in New England, um, in New Hampshire, activists will be shutting down the last major coal-fired power plant. Um, and there's also ongoing actions in Minnesota. So we really encourage people to get to know about those actions. Again, 350.org slash strike USA. And then lastly, I would say that um, we really want folks to pay attention to the fight against the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, this is a top uh, priority for the Trump administration. They really want to push forward this pipeline ahead of the 2020 election. And we know that our movement is made stronger when we work in solidarity and follow the leadership of those directly impacted by the climate crisis. So we've teamed up with indigenous leaders and farmers and ranchers along the KXL route um, for the promise to protect, um, which is a commitment to participate in creative resistance along the route if invited. Uh, so you can join um, the promise to protect at nokxlpromise.org. I know that was a lot of information, but the, that's a, a, a lot of the kinds of actions that you can get involved in, as well as continuing to support young people who will continue to strike. Thank you. Thanks. And yeah, we've been getting the URLs up in the chat box. So um, if folks also still have, have questions about things that, that Tani said that, that we've missed in there, please go ahead and drop that in there and we'll add it in. So maybe to, to bring the next steps conversation up to, up to Canada, um, our federal election on the 21st of October, and Asha mentioned um, our time and the, the work that our time is doing here, maybe, um, maybe just, just taking it from, you know, what's it gonna look like on the 28th? And, you know, we'll be sort of three and a half weeks away from our federal election at that point. The Keystone XL pipeline, obviously something super important for us here, um, but also the Trans Mountain pipeline being a pipeline that we've been fighting um, also fossil fuel extraction out of Northern Alberta, all pretty important things to us mm -hmm. and the, the place that we care about. Yeah, so come September 28th, first thing we're going to do is we're going to sleep in because we've been working very, very hard for this strike. And then we have to start mobilizing for the federal election in Canada. So we haven't really had a lot of time to work on it because we've been concentrating all of our energies towards the week of action and in particular September 27th. But we're in the process of developing a comprehensive election plan because we recognize that in Canada, our youth demographic makes up a quarter of the vote. So we have the ability to influence massive change. And so we need to make sure that people in our demographics are getting out there, are getting educated and are registering to vote. So first of all, let's talk about the first part of that and getting educated. So there are a couple of really amazing organizations in Canada that we are, we've been collaborating with and that are working to make sure people get organized. One of which that we've been working very closely with is Shake Up the Establishment. And they're a youth-led grassroots organization that has been creating basically these comprehensive outlines of what all of the candidates have to offer when it comes to climate. And they've been posting all of these details on their website, kind of like a cheat sheet for the election, because it can be very hard to follow politicians and their rhetoric and what they're actually going to follow through on. So this organization has really been breaking it down into language that is understandable for younger demographics and not just political jargon, so that we can become more educated and make informed choices when it comes to the election. Uh, another organization that actually one of our organizers, Peyton Mitchell, is an organizer with um, Future Majority. And they're an organization that has been going to universities and classrooms and encouraging people to actually go and register and vote. Because that is an issue that we have seen historically in Canada, voter apathy, particularly when it comes to younger citizens. But we've been really working to change that, rather having youth go out there and encourage other people to go and vote. And that's something we've seen growing and growing over the last few months that we are the ones who are really leading the, the charge to vote, even if we can't vote yet. So like, I'll be 17 come the election. I won't be able to vote, unfortunately, but I know that's all I talk about with most people who are over 18, that they need to go out and vote because we're counting on them. We only have so many venues in which we can advocate for legislative change, but we can't fully use our, democ our democratic powers until we become 18. So for everyone who is on this call today who is over 18 and who is in Canada, we are really asking you to go and use that power, become educated and vote when it comes to the Canadian federal election because you're voting for the rest of us who don't have a chance to defend our future in that way. So yeah, we haven't, and then there will be more details available online, on social media, and on climatestrikecanada.org when we have our full plan set out for the election. But those are some things 
to get started. That's great. Um, so thank you. Thank you, all of you. Um, having, there's some questions that are popping up in the chat box, um, which we can um, move into attempt to address some of them. But I think, you know, one of the, um, one of the main things that's coming up and was certainly what we were interested about putting this call together and having the conversation is, is around how we take all the energy that's been created and push that into voting power. Um, so think some some of the questions that were around, you know, what should we do next or what how, what have the strikes helped build? I think if any, if Felicon or or I think Asha sort of just did it, but talking to address about what we need to do is then be converting folks that can vote to be voting for climate leaders. Felicon, I don't know if you have anything to add on to that or you're, if you're seeing any of these questions, any of them particularly speak to you in the box? Yeah, um, so I mean, I agree we need to um, convert every, all the voting power as possible. Someone just mentioned a, a, a very important question. They said, um, could we talk about breaking down the myth that voting is the most powerful way to use our democratic power? Um, you can only vote once every few years, but you can organize and agitate the way everyone is on here 365 days a year. So that's way more powerful. So I'm just going to go from my opinion. And I, I agree to an extent that organizing sometimes um, is the most powerful way we can make change. Um, I can't vote. And obviously, if you can vote, you need to vote. Please vote. I beg you to. Um, and that is so important. But organizing is a, an extremely powerful way also to influence elections. Um, for example, we had a huge initiative here. We started an initiative um, with my organization to call for a climate debate, so a climate-centered debate for all the presidential candidates um, to come down and speak about climate issues. Obviously, all the uh, this is for a democratic debate, so all the democratic candidates, they believe in climate change. It's not a debate on whether or not climate change exists. It's a debate on how are we going to address this. And so this was organizing power 100%. There's almost nobody in our organization who can vote. Um, so this is our way of making change. And although we were not successful in getting the, the um, debate itself, what we did get was a seven hour town hall uh, with the top 10 candidates um, on one of our biggest media stations in the US, which is CNN. Um, talking about climate crisis, literally just, just the fact that in big words, you see climate crisis and TVs all over the US was a huge shift from what we had in past elections. In 2016, there was five minutes and a couple seconds of d discussion over all what there was over 10, over 12 uh, primary election debates, I believe, and uh, tons of general elections debates. Throughout all of those, only five minutes of discussion. And through our organizing power, we were able to completely change the dialogue, completely change the situation here in the US. So I think that one important thing is not only converting this energy um, into voting power, which is incredibly important, and one of the most important things we can do, but also organizer and organizing power. Um, so that was a great question. I think that organizing is a very incredible and important part of this conversation that we need to be having. I wonder about the question um, from either of your experiences is, you know, just what's a good way to get the school, get, to get a school climate strike started and maybe to your experiences or other folks that you've talked to about what was it like to take that first action and skip class. I think that the comment in the box is most students are scared that they'll get in trouble for skipping class. Somebody had to do it. Yeah, so um, on that topic, we have a really great role model when it comes to Greta Thunberg that she started this movement. So we do have, uh, we have a real inspiration that way. And I think that's how it really, sp it spread worldwide because people saw that example and realized that climate crisis is way more urgent than we were ever taught. And that's part of the issue too, why people fear getting in trouble and skipping class, missing tests, because the knowledge that we, uh, the information that we receive about the climate crisis in school is not really that it's a climate crisis at all. We just hear about climate change. We don't really hear any of the immediacy or the urgency and how important it is that we act and we act boldly to reduce emissions and to stop this crisis before it's too late. So first of all, changing that narrative that we do have time to grow up and then solve this as adults and that it's okay, we can just stay in school and expect the adults to fix it for us. So the first step is changing that narrative, which I think is what Greta Thunberg has really done, teaching us that we don't have time to wait, that it's time to mobilize now. Now, in terms of 
pe teachers getting mad and skipping class and all that, it definitely is an issue. And it was certainly an issue when we got started. I know I was very fortunate personally. My principal wasn't necessarily against the climate strikes. I wasn't really allowed to promote it too much, but I wasn't going to get in trouble for skipping school to go. But I know that my experience is not indicative of many other people's experiences. And a lot of people did get in trouble and face repercussions from their school because they were missing class. But we see that the narrative is changing somewhat because we are making this into an intergenerational effort again. We are getting teachers involved. We are getting um, teachers unions actually very recently, just last night, I believe it was in Vancouver, the Vancouver School Board voted to support the climate strikes. So it is becoming a little bit more normalized and it is becoming, it's becoming less difficult for people to skip school to attend the strikes. So I guess the best answer to that question would be it's to follow in the example of other climate strikers and to know that it is getting easier with every passing date, but you have to make that first step. It does seem difficult at first to, yeah, to go against the grain to some extent, especially if people in your community aren't mobilizing yet, but know that you have a global community of strikers who know all about those experiences and are willing to support you. So in Canada, that's why we have the overarching network of Climate Strike Canada, because we're connecting both the major cities like Vancouver and Toronto and Montreal, but we're also connecting with those smaller communities that don't necessarily have role models and don't know what to do to get started. So there are definitely people you can reach out to. Reach out to your local organizing groups or your national organizing group and we'll help you get started. We know how to do, uh, we're learning more and more about activism every day and we can help you take that first step, but it's definitely worth it. Yeah, and to touch on that a little bit, um, we also can't underestimate how important our people power is. So that I mean that in two ways. First of all, if there's tons of people striking, for example, from a singular school, there's a very small chance that that school is going to take disciplinary action over all of these students. Say if you have a couple hundred students from a school of like a thousand people, the school is not going to want to take disciplinary action against all those students because that's just really not good for the school in the long run. But on top of that, using our organizing power to literally get school excused. So we did that in the US. Um, it wasn't an idea that, it was an idea that sadly came up uh, later and very close to the climate strike, I think probably like three or four days before um, September 20th. But um, they had the idea to like, what if we just got the schools to literally ex give an excuse absence on September 20th. And um, this happened in New York City um, allowing millions more, like millions more people to have the opportunity to strike and definitely contributed to such a large turnout that we had um, on September 20th. It happened in Minnesota as well, and um, I believe a few other places. But if we had that idea way before, we would have been working um, long before to make sure that, you know, schools all over the U.S. got excused absences. So that's something that we can look towards um, for the next strike, trying to see if we can use our organizing power to get these school boards to give an excuse absence for people um, on those Friday strikes. Oh, thanks. I know there's a, if you have some comments too, but I'm seeing there's a bunch of questions around divestment and targeting financial banks and stuff. Just wondering if you wanted to talk to the 350s worker on that. Yeah, sure. I see this question from Anne. Bill McKibben wrote an article last week in the New Yorker that suggested that targeting, that targeting financial companies have an enormous influence all over the world could be a more rapid way of affecting change than the political process. Is this something you have any thoughts about? Um, so, you know, again, I think that there's multiple tactics and um, that particular article speaks to where it's one tactic. Uh, financial it, calling for divestment is a call for trillions of dollars to be uh, taken out of the fossil fuel industry. And when we target, whether it's museums, whether it's financial institutions, to really reallocate their money, um, that really helps to signal um, a larger movement for change. And that in and of itself can actually impact the political process. So I would say that uh, the targeting of financial institutions is extremely important. Um, I did see that there was a question around um, how do we pressure banks, insurance companies, asset managers to divest from investment in fossil fuel companies. There's tons of different actions that can be taken. Actually, some of the actions happening this week in places like San Francisco, Seattle, um, Boston are actually also going to be, um, you know, finance actions. Uh, this week, it, the UN Climate Action Summit is happening and there were finance actions here as well. Um, I would say get involved in your local community. Um, targeting banks is effective. It is actually a way of also shaming institutions um, and calling, you know, calling for accountability from corporations. Um, 
you know, when, when people are, are, are demanding that their money be invested differently, um, that can really help to also shift narratives. And so it's, we're in a really incredible time where, um, you know, we're in a, where the mainstream narrative is really around um, stop it, the, the need to stop the fossil fuel industry, the needs to phase off of fossil fuels to 100% renewables. And so all of these tactics are pretty critical. I was, um, I was gonna add, talking about um, calling for an end to the age of fossil fuels in that the work that we did at Lush in the build up um, to September 20th was working to convene businesses and you know, just because we're Lush and we're a business, um, but working to convene other businesses and definitely recruit participation, but had, um, had companies sign on to a letter that directly did call um, for the end of the age of fossil fuel extraction. And I was thinking about that the other day, that's something that's not new to Lush. We've, we've done that um, in terms of our campaigns around the um, tar sands and, and against pipelines. Um, for a number of years, but for a lot of companies, I think it was the first time that they were making such a call. And I think to what all three of you have also been saying, just that this is a new era and there's a new time, but the willingness um, for, you know, what can be seen as a more conservative bunch of businesses, um, but for, for to be in a period where folks are actually calling for that um, and joining the voices that have been doing that really important work for so long, I think is, I'm, I'm hopeful about that. So we had a couple of more minutes here if um, anyone else had questions or wanted to make comments in the box there. Um, but then I guess would also just encourage, you know, you all in terms of, we've had some things about the, here's the next things that you can do. Um, but if there's anything else, what, what the call at this point is um, for folks to continue to be engaged. Um, but any of, any of your kind of remarks that, that help us close today. Um, I mean, I guess while we wait for any more questions to come in, I'll take this opportunity to talk about, if anyone noticed, I'm wearing a green circle pin right here. So the green circle is a symbol of solidarity. It originated back in Montreal several months ago, and it has now become a symbol of solidarity with the youth climate movement. But the nice thing about this symbol is that you don't have to be a young person to wear it. Anyone can wear this at any time to pledge your support for everything that we've been doing and to show that you realize again that it's not business as usual that we do that we are in the midst of a crisis and we need to act accordingly and that you're showing your support for climate strikers in Canada and around the world. So all we all you need to do to make one of these is it's just green felt. So you can take green felt, cut it out into a circle and put a pin in it. It doesn't necessarily have to be felt. I know some people prefer to use t-shirts. One thing that we found actually quite interestingly, one of our organizers in Vancouver found a way of recycling the felt scraps. So we have as little waste as possible when it comes to these circle pins. And yeah, if you would like to make one of those, be sure to post a photo of yourself on social media using hashtag green circle or hashtag circle vert, depending on whether you'd like to use the English or the French. And yeah, so we've been using it across Canada and we'd love to see other countries take this on. So Felicon, if you'd like to pass that along to other US organizers, we'd be very grateful. Yeah. There's this question, what can I do in my community to help encourage others to stand up for climate justice and climate rights? Does anyone wanna take that? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll go ahead and take that one. So I think that a big part of it is going to be the organizing work that you're doing on the ground. Um, and yeah, just getting the word out to everyone on the ground and helping them understand, you know, what's going on with our world and how it would directly impact our community. I think that's one of the most important and one of the best ways to kind of raise awareness, really community specific. Like this is what our community may look like in however many years. This is how these policies would help our community, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's really important work that needs to be done um, on local levels. And so I can speak on that for, from experience. I live in Florida. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Florida is a kind of swing state, but we keep going kind of the wrong way, swinging the wrong way in the past couple elections, and not necessarily towards people who care about um, the climate crisis or towards environmental issues. And not, but not only that, I live in one of the most conservative areas in this entire state. And so we had a strike 
um, on September 20th and on March 15th. Uh, back in March 15th, I was a state and local organizer. Now I'm a national organizer, so I wasn't as plugged in this time. But in March 15th, we were able to get hundreds and hundreds of people in this ex incredibly rural area of Florida out striking in solidarity with the people all over the world for this crisis because we were able to illustrate to them how this would matter to them and how this was important to them, how this is science. In fact, it's not about left or right. This is just the facts. This is what's happening. Um, and they understood that. So once you're able to really illustrate how it's important to your community and illustrate really the facts on it, it's not a political issue. This is going to affect every single person on this planet. Um, people will listen and people will mobilize. I guess that's a, also a so thoughtful uh, way for the question there too with Thanksgiving coming up, just sort of how to bring up the conversation at that, at that table. Yeah, so I was actually going to say the exact same thing that Felicon said that personally I believe and many of us believe that climate crisis should not be a partisan issue because it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you stand on, everyone is going to be affected by the climate crisis in some way or another. And we recognize that definitely there are people in frontline communities who will see that impact first. But at the end of the day, everyone is going to see that impact and we need to unite behind the science. So in answer to that question, how do you talk to, to family about the climate crisis? I know that for a lot of families, if there are people of differing political beliefs, it can be very awkward. If people, if you have cli climate deniers around the table, they might not be so receptive to hearing about that. So really, I think the best way is to frame it in terms of the science because you can't argue with facts. Facts cannot be political, and especially when it comes to an issue like climate crisis. So bringing up the science, talking about the IPCC report that we only have until 2030 to get emissions below 1.5 degrees Celsius, talking about those facts and not talking about it in terms of a political issue, I think would definitely be, would definitely be a really great way to talk about that. And also talking about how it will affect you in your life, because I know I come from a place of privilege here in Vancouver, not being a person of color, not being part of those frontline communities. So it can be very easy to see sometimes how people don't necessarily recognize how important this issue is because they can't always see the impact in their lives. So bringing the conversation back to issues around the world and how people are concretely seeing that climate crisis is impacting their lives and touching on the human aspect of things because it really is a human issue above all before it's a political issue or a scientific issue it is a human issue and i believe i'd like to believe that everyone can unite when it comes to talking about the impact on people yeah, yeah. and can i just add a little bit more to that um, I think something that's also really important is to not only talk about the projections, so in 10 years it'll be irreversible and in however many years it's going to happen, but also talk about what's already happened and what's already happening. So people understand this isn't some kind of, oh, maybe this will happen in the future, we have to act uh, later, or maybe it's happening in the future, or maybe the scientists are just blah, 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 some agenda, or whatever, whatever. But this is literally already happening and we have the proof now. It has nothing to do with um, just projections. So for example, we can talk about how these past summers, um, I think it's the past, either past four or five summers have been the hottest summers in literally global records in history. Um, we can talk about how these hurricane seasons have been literally the worst ones in history. We can talk about how the ice caps and all over the world waters are rising at rates faster than in history. Literally, just you can also just talk about what's happening now and what's already happened. And I think that's one of the best ways to kind of change people's mind, to understand that it's not something that's just gonna come in the future, but we literally already have the facts of what's happening. Yeah, I think that's a, such an important point. And, um, you know, it, like climate impacts are happening now. And I think that one of the things that we can do, and, and this is what the global climate strikes have helped to do, it is a household conversation. Um, you know, to talk about the climate crisis. Um, you know, one of the most inspiring moments I had right after the strikes, I was like scrambling to, you know, get something out. And I was in a coffee shop with so just like young people in New York, like literally, you know, getting their coffee after the strike, like talking about the fossil fuel industry. I had never seen that before. It was super amazing and impactful. And I also want to just shout out, um, you know, communities that I know in the Pacific Islands who are really about resistance. And one of their, um, uh, the Pacific Climate Warriors of 350 Pacific, they, they always say, we are not drowning, we are fighting. Um, and so there is resistance happening now um, in frontline communities 
to the climate crisis. And so just getting to also know like what the impacts are on different communities um, is also like super critical and can really help you mobilize people in your communities. Um, and, and beyond just like, you know, places that are, you know, far from where you are locally, just understanding what the local impacts are. And so that's why I think some of these um, local actions happening in this week in places like New Hampshire and Minnesota in the Bay Area really shows that uh, the climate crisis seems like this big thing and it seems like it's something that you can't see, but it actually does have really local impacts. It's about the air we breathe. It's about the water we drink. Um, and it's about communities being able to live their lives without a pipeline going through their communities. Um, and so there's a real connection between environmental and climate justice. I am, yeah, I'm just paying attention to the conversation in the chats on the side. So that is great. And, and thanks for folks that are putting resources up there. Um, wondering if, wondering if folks want to say some last words. Um, there's definitely some questions that people have about still how to engage, um, engage their schools, whether it's at university or high school. I know, um, I know for us, we, we directed people a lot to globalclimatestrike.net, and I think there's some good stuff there about how to start a strike and um, some conversations to have with the administration. So I'm not sure if there's some other tools that you all used, but, um, but I know I found that, that stuff pretty inspiring for folks that were asking us how to be more involved. Yeah, so I wanted to comment on the school part a bit. So I want people to understand this is a movement against global establishments, right? And there is a very high chance that your schools are not going to support this. So I'm talking about your school board or your uh, school staff, et cetera, is not, gonna, is not gonna support this. I can tell you for 100% fact that no matter what I told my school staff, they were not going to support this. This is a almost revolutionary moment in history. And sometimes we don't need to be going to these institutions for support. Sometimes you're gonna to have to organize under these institutions. You're gonna to have to build your own teams that are not going to be working with the staff and not working with the school board to raise awareness for the strike and to organize these strikes. So it's, it's sometimes gonna be an upward battle, but if you keep working on it, I swear to you that it's going to be possible and that you're going to get it done um, as long as you build teams within your schools and as long as you just spread awareness and go directly to the students you don't have to go to the school board go directly to your target audience um, and do what we talked about localize the issue tell them about how this is something that's already happening and something that's going to only get worse from now we only have 10 years left to solve it but we have the ability to build a better future if we do once you do that you can mobilize tons of people in your school and in your community Uh, yeah, so I'll just build on that idea a little bit about finding your community because you need to build a network of allies within your school. Even if your school doesn't specifically support it, there will be other students who want to go out to the strikes and maybe they're nervous, but by building that community within the school network, then you can, then people won't be so afraid when it comes to going out on the strikes. And like Philoquan said, a lot of organizing, a lot of establishments like schools won't support it. And that is very much location dependent. I know here in Vancouver, things are starting to change. We have had school boards starting to vote to support the strikes, but I realize that could very much be very different in Florida. So if you are coming to us from a location that isn't super supportive, definitely figure out how to work around those rules. Um, if you, I would say it's not preferable, but if you do, if your or if your administration will not support it by any chance, just don't give them the reason why you're leaving school. It, just say that you're going to a protest or going to a rally or going to an event, something like that. Anything that will get you out of that classroom, it's baby steps. So if at first they're not going to accept that you're going to a climate strike, just find a way to be able to go and from there work on changing that mentality within your school by building the network, changing the conversations, talking to people about the climate crisis and normalizing it as a topic of conversation, things will change. And we've seen them changing here. And yeah, hopefully it won't be such a big issue for students to leave school. Rather, it will be the accepted norm. Yeah, just repeating what Aisha said, like I was I was sick on September 20th. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a lot of methods that you can do to get uh, past those those rules. I know it's super inspiring um, and I've seen a couple of people post some comments around you know having done some work for 
years on climate and you know but this moment in time feeling not only that you all have been so amazing at making the urgency something so front and center but also um being able to i think i think tanya said sort of like very pointedly um speaking to what the what the blockages and what the problems have been around helping us get to solutions so um i know that's been something that's really inspiring for us all across the business and um Looking forward to being out on the streets. Maybe, um, maybe the last thing, if you all are wanting to put out, like how people can find out more about what you're doing or um, the organization that you're attached to, if you want to just give those resources out to people, and then um, we'll probably close the call. Yeah, so I guess I'll go ahead and start. So uh, my organization is on Twitter and Instagram at US Climate Strike. Um, we're website building right now, so our website is not up right now, it's down, but if you want to learn about the actions that we've, we've been doing it through the coalition website, so there's strikewithus.org and there's also obviously globalclimatestrike.net um, slash USA, which is by 350 as well, so you can use those, but yes, look at our social media, we're going to be doing a lot of huge um, expansions of our national, state, and local teams, so we can really get right back into the work of organizing, um, hardcore organizing, huge campaigns coming up, so definitely check that out. And um, we'd love to have you guys involved. Yeah, um, 350.org, um, at 350.org on um, all social media, uh, the websites to follow our strike with us, and globalclimatestrike.net. Okay, for us, for social media, for the national level, we are on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. So Facebook and Instagram, at Climate Strike Canada and Twitter at Canada underscore strike. If you are located in the greater Vancouver area, then Sustainability Teens would be your local organizing group. So again, Facebook and Instagram at Sustainability Teens. I'll put that in the chat. And on Twitter at Sustain Teens. Again, I'll put that down. And our website is climatestrikecanada.org. Cool. Yeah, and for folks that are um, on the call from Canada, if you are, um, if you are, out on this Friday in Canada when you have a local Lush store, definitely look for your Lush folks. Um, they'll be on the street and I know we would um, be happy to be marching together. And so a big thank you um, to folks on the call and thank you all for joining us. I know um, it was really great to put together the joint webinar. So I know there's some folks that maybe came in through Lush and some folks that came in through 350. So we're um, excited to be working together and welcome and, and hope this is just the beginning of the conversation. So thank you all for your work. Thank you for having us. Thank you.